All right, so like I said, we're gonna connect a lot of things we heard this morning from um, uh, the doctor on uh, learning from outside of our industry. We're gonna listen, you'll learn a little bit more about storytelling, flow, all kinds of interesting things are gonna come out of this, including uh, customer service or customer focus. So uh, have any of you ever made a decision that changed, let's make it a last minute decision that changed your life for the lives of others? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's where I'm gonna start. So it's taken me a while to get to this uh, story uh, for a reason, uh, and, and I think it'll be apparent here in a little while. But uh, 17 years of struggling with it, I feel like really came around to understanding it, and I put it out there as one of the first things that, on how I introduced myself. So it's really about a seat change, and it begins with a around 4 a.m., and I'm standing outside a hatch, a door that leads to a work center aboard the USS Constellation. And about 15 minutes prior to this, my commanding officer who happened to be up at this early hour of the, of the morning, as were all of the officers of our fighter squadron, he suggested that all division officers and branch officers go out and engage with our sailors to share what information we had about the night's events. Now, let me give you some more context about an aircraft carrier. So it's about four and a half acres of sovereign territory where we live and fly and eat off of this thing all day long. This is different than any other type of aviation, not just because we fly and land on aircraft carriers at sea, but after the military spends about $5 million on training us on how to fly these fighter aircraft, our primary job shifts to leading sailors. Our secondary job is to work in small teams and employ advanced technology. Now, here I am standing at this hatch and I open it up and I see three of my sailors look at me with fear and confusion in their eyes. I step across the knee knocker, I take a deep breath, and before I could say anything, one of the sailors looks up at me and says, sir, I do not understand. What are you doing here? And me being a little confused, and, and I had this rehearsed response that went something like this. Well, I'm here to share with you the information we had from the night's events, and I want to reassure you that your work did not uh, result in this, this loss of an aircraft, this aircraft 104. And the sailor looked up at me and said, sir, but everybody in the squadron, everybody in maintenance, everybody on this aircraft carrier knows that you are in aircraft 104, the aircraft that we just lost at sea. And he points to this flight schedule that's right next to my head as I walk through that hatch. And he says, see, you are in aircraft 104. It was this sailor's orientation mixed with the experiences that I had over the last 12 hours that would forever shape the way I would observe, decide, and act. So let me tell you about the mission. The mission that night was a leadership apprentice mission that is developed by Top Gun, our, our fighter weapons school. We take new leaders and we run them through this apprentice program, and at the end, they become a mission commander. And this is my mission commander qualification flight. My job that night is to lead three F-14s pictured here with six crew members and defend in a simulated defense against bad aircraft coming to attack the aircraft carrier. So what we're gonna be evaluated on that night as a division, our three aircraft, is on how well we brief the plan, how well we communicate, how to well do we build situational awareness through building maps and shared mental models, and if we accomplish the mission. Now I'm going to be, be evaluated on how well I develop the plan if, my, if I made my intent clear, and how well I shared that intent, as well as how well I led the debrief. So let me give you some more context about this night. We just left a combat operating area where we've been flying combat missions for about three or four months. Uh, one of the things about flying combat missions at night is we're wearing, we wear night vision goggles, so you're looking through soda straws. And night vision goggles really look for light uh, out in the horizon. And where we were flying combat, we had lights all around us. We had the lights of the cities. We had lights from the firewells. We could see the horizon pretty much any time with our night vision goggles. But now we were operating in the Bay of Bengal, just south of India. And this is what our operating environment looked like through the night vision goggles. Basically, you have the stars that are reflecting off the sea, making up look like down, and down look like up. So I thought about this, and I said, hey, you know, we're not used to flying in this environment and we're about to do a very advanced training mission. And I decided that we're not going to do this particular maneuver. So let me walk you through this maneuver, and I'll use pounds as an example. So I weigh about 200 pounds right now. That's a lie. 
Okay. <laughs> all right, so back then I weighed about 200 pounds. My 200 pound body has all this gear on me and I'm strapped in this fighter aircraft. And what we're going to do in this maneuver is we're going to pull about five or six G's to the horizon, which makes my body now weigh 1,000 or 1,200 pounds. We're going to roll the aircraft inverted and dive to the deck as fast as we can. We're going to roll the aircraft upright and we're going to pitch back up, either go back into the fight or run away from the fight. Now, on top of our heads, we have what is the equivalent of a bowling ball, about a 15 pound bowling ball with all, all our gear on our head. So you got a 75 to 95 pounds of pressure pushing down on you like this. You're looking through soda straws. And I said, we're not going to do this. It, it, there's no reason to take this risk tonight. So at the brief, I had to lead, lead the brief where we go through our objectives, our outcomes that we're trying to achieve. We look at our technology. Do we have everything we ha need to have to accomplish this mission? At that point, we only had two of the required three aircraft. We looked at the threats. We looked at the environment. And I stated three times during a brief that we are not going to do this maneuver. Three times. One, two, three. Don't do it. All right, so after this 90-minute brief, we would go off to dinner. We had enough time to eat dinner that evening. And sitting at dinner, I'm sitting with the, the crew that I'll be flying with, the, the five other members of our division, our three Tomcats. And at dinner, we had a new piece of information come up. Actually, two pieces of information. The first piece of information was, you now have three aircraft, OK? We originally had two. And our training officer suggested that if I swap out seats with one other person, we can get more qualifications done that evening. So I ran the mental simulation through my head, and I realized there's no threat about this. There's, there's, you know, we're going to achieve the mission by doing it. It's safe. And I decided to ask the other five members, hey, what do you think about this? Give me your feedback. All but one said, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's go ahead and do it. So I ended up sw switching out of aircraft 104 into another aircraft, but I would remain the lead. And I would swap out with my old roommate, a father of two, um, and he would fly in my role in another aircraft. So we fly out, we execute the mission, and about 20 minutes in the ex of the mission, I call a knock it off. I just say, knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. And at that point, we achieved all, our, all of the objectives. It was time to head back home. And it was as we were heading back home to the carrier to land on it, we realized that aircraft 104 was lost at sea. Two of my friends, two of my squadron mates, my old roommate, crashed into the Sea of Bengal going supersonic, 70 degrees nose low. They executed that maneuver three times that night. So the Navy has a debrief culture. Uh, we follow a simple, repeatable, scalable process to understand what happened. We leverage multiple perspectives in this to understand what happened and then dive into the how and why. So I'm leading the debrief, and in this room now, I have my commanding officer and a bunch of observers that are there to start the black box approach to understanding what happened. And their approach is really to understand the system and fix the system and not assign blame to anyone. So I go ahead and start the debrief. I go through the basics of what we talked about during the planning process or the, the briefing process, which included the objectives, the threats, the uh, change of aircraft and all that. And I also mentioned that we're not going to do this maneuver three times at night. So I run through the basics that we just ran through in the brief. And I do something a little unusual that I find executives have a hard time doing right now. And I'm standing up in front of everybody, and I say, hey, as the mission commander uh, was late, I was late in checking us in, coming out of the area, um, was about five minutes late on that, that's my bust. And why that's important is that's a standard operating procedure that I failed to, to do. And the reason we have it is to switch or use a trigger to switch from our operations to landing on an aircraft carrier. It gets us prepared to land. So in front of everybody, I, I admitted a failure. Hey, I, I screwed this up tonight. The reason we do that is it creates psychological safety. And in naval aviation, you need to be fallible. You need to display that you are human so you can always un identify those weak signals. And it's those weak signals from individuals that really are behind novelty, innovation, safety, and resilience. So about 40 minutes into the debrief, a junior F-18 pilot who happened to be our red air that night, or the bad guys, 
He tells everybody in the room, I have a bad lock. I lost situational awareness to aircraft 104. I screwed up. So he calls himself out, but then he quickly realizes, wait a minute, the timeline matches up with where we lost this aircraft. And he stands up and says, I think I have aircraft 104 on radar tape. And he pulls the tape out and puts it in the machine. And sure enough, there's this bad radar lock watch, watching the aircraft 104 go right into the water. It was through this debrief, through this multiple perspectives, that we we're able to reconstruct what happened. We call that accountability. Then we move on to the how and why. We call that learning. So one of my other failures that night that I struggled with over the last 18 years is I missed that weak signal um, from, from the officer who said, I, I don't want to do this. And it's called retrospective coherence. We look back at things and we realize, hey, we missed this. Um, but it is not what caused the accident. So what ended up happening over time is this become my why, my why behind what I do, uh, mainly because we see things repeat in different industries because of the same processes, because of the same factors. And what I want to do with my life and what I've been doing with, with my life is I want to make sure that when fathers, brothers, aunts, sisters, mothers, cousins go out to sea on a training mission, that they all come back safely. I want to make sure that the third leading cause of death in the U.S., does anybody know what it is right now? No, it's, it's human factors, it's teamwork, teamwork and leadership related. I want to make sure we can fix that. I want to make sure that uh, if children are left in the back of a car, in a hot car, on a hot summer day, that we don't attack the parent, that we actually use the technology so that never happens again. So we're not assigning blame to parents that are fallible and make mistakes. I also want to make sure that organizational leaders do not get fixated on their current business model and drive their companies into failure. And I certainly do not want to see companies build software that kills a company, or worse, kills a customer. And that's happening right now. So I'm going to give you some uh, main takeaways. We're going to dive into a few things here in a moment. So the three takeaways that I learned uh, from this experience and what I'm doing right now are these. Number one, Humans are complex adaptive systems. We have intent, identity, and intelligence. We are different than any other type of system out there. What this means is you cannot apply a manufacturing approach or engineering approach to a human system. The second thing is we need to learn how to separate our decisions from outcomes in this VUCA, our volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. The decision I made that night is correlated to the outcome. It didn't cause it. So I know that now. And of course, I want to throw this out to you that uh, human performance and organization follows a power law distribution. And it looks something like this. If you think about the storytelling as being a, a, a major part of an organization, communication captures that up there. Leadership, adaptability, situational awareness, mission analysis. Do we know how to plan? Do we know how to debrief? These are more important than the technical skills that most companies are going after right now. And they're certainly more important than platitudes, methods, frameworks, all those things that are being sold to organizations by large consultancies. We need to focus on the soft skills, the social skills, those interaction skills now more than ever. But there are other takeaways from this story and, and what I'm sharing with you. And in fact, there's, we could talk about situational awareness, weak signal detection, psychological safety, red teaming, uh, high reliability organizations, there's so much we can pull from the story. But what I'm going to do today is just bucket them into three categories. And the first category is complexity thinking. Second one is distributed leadership. And the third is team science. Now, imagine if we were to put this inside a framework or a system where we focused on the customer and built it upon something that is very valuable in industry today. And that's something we did in the flow system. We've taken the, the triple helix, we call that, and we added it to the Toyota production system and the Toyota way focused on the customer. Customer is at the central of uh, everything we do. Now, who here is familiar with the Toyota production system? Just raise your hand. Okay, most people should know that the Toyota production system has two pillars. It has Jidoka and um, just-in-time production. Jidoka means 
automation with a human touch. I, I cannot think of a more important idea right now than to make sure humans remain in the systems that we develop. We don't want to automate everything. And of course, just in time, product, production has proven its value over time. The Toyota way is really just a philosophy. I think it's a great philosophy. It's about continuous improvement and respect for humanity or respect for people. And then at the top, like I said, we have the, uh, the customer as the central, as, uh, as our focus, and then our triple helix there. Now, this is a system of understanding. It really helps us navigate and operate in volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times. But there's more to it. In fact, uh, I want to dive briefly into just two frameworks, two universal frameworks that uh, I think you should be aware of. And the first one is the Kinevin framework, and it's pronounced Kinevin. It is a sense-making framework. It helps us make sense of our environment so we can act in it. For a leader, what they need to know is they need to understand the context before they apply the method. And right now, the, uh, the Kinevin framework really has five domains. There's a clear, complicated, complex, and chaotic domains. And then in the center is the domain of disorder, which means we don't know where we are. And if you think about how humans always try to try to drive towards order, in our complex environment, what we end up doing is we create processes, policies, uh, checklists that try to drive everything to order. And that's not necessarily uh, right. We need to think about that and how we do that uh, going forward. The next uh, framework is a decision-making framework that comes from the military as well. And this one is known as the OODA loop, the Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act loop. Who here is familiar with it, by the way? No one? Okay. So the OODA loop is a nonlinear decision-making process. It is what is behind the concept known as Scrum. Anybody familiar with Scrum, Scrum Project Management? It's also behind the concept known as the Lean Startup. And for those of you that have their phones up right now, if you push Siri and ask Siri, what is, what is the Observe, Orient, Decide, Act loop? Uh, Siri will come back and say, agility is an outcome of the OODA loop, and it is used in cybersecurity. Moreover the, uh, me, the, moreover, the OODA loop is behind third generation warfare, which is maneuver warfare, fourth generation warfare, and fifth generation warfare. Fifth generation warfare, you're experiencing every single day. That's social. Everybody's trying to influence you. And by the way, you can use the same approach on customers. Uh, another way to think about the OODA loop is it is used in big data, strategy, first responders, and in human machine teaming. It's, it is, to me, it is a universal framework. Another way to think about it is, it is a individual and organizational learning and adaption process, a paradigm for survival and growth in our VUCA world. So I threw a lot at you today, a story, a lot of concepts. Uh, this is a fire hose, I understand that. But I, want, but I wanna make sure you walk out of here with three things, and it's really simple. And you've already heard this earlier today from Corey. First one is we need to shift from linear to nonlinear thinking. We need to think about complex adaptive systems, more about our human uh, selves. Second, we need to build teamwork and leadership skills. You can't just assume people know how to do that. You, leadership and teamwork can actually be taught. And of course, you need to focus on your customer. All right, so I wanna wrap this up uh, and just kind of bring it all together. It is the, the PTSD, the survivor's guilt that I had from that experience that has turned into a mission, a, a mission to train and teach human factors, which are social skills, interaction skills, and teach nonlinear thinking to executives who do not want to leave change to chance. That's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you very much.